episode of Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Elland. Just before we get to our guest, I'd like to say that we have changed our donate page somewhat. There was some concern with people donating that the word cannabis, as in Cannabis Health Radio, would appear on their credit card. So what we've done is we've changed it to CHR Podcast. So if you'd like to donate and keep our engine running, Go to the donate page, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and make a contribution today. You can make a one-time contribution, monthly contribution, or a yearly contribution, whatever you like. Anything helps us and keeps the fundraising efforts here at Cannabis Health Radio going so we can continue to keep these podcasts going and uh, tell people around the world about the use of cannabis and how beneficial it is to one's health. So that's CannabisHealthRadio.com. Go to the donate page. You make a contribution. It'll show up on your credit card as CHR Podcast. And for those who have contributed so far, we'd like to say thank you very much. For the second time this week, we're going to talk to someone who was diagnosed with a brain tumor and both live in the United Kingdom. Joining us to talk about his experience with dealing with a brain tumor and the use of cannabis is Phil James. Phil, good of you to do this. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me, guys. Take us back to Christmas Day of 2015 and tell us what happened to you. Yeah, sure. So I was at my parents' holiday home in North Wales, and I was due to drive to Chester, uh, which is where my fiancé lived with her parents. And um, when I got there, I was extremely tired. I had never felt tiredness like this before, so I had to be honest and say to everyone that, that was there, all their family was there, and just say that I've got to go have a nap. I'm extremely tired. So I went away for about like an hour or so, and then I came downstairs, and I, you know, because it was Christmas, I felt like I had a duty to stay up a bit longer. So I I waited until everyone else went up to bed then. And then um, the last thing I remember from that night after we went to bed was uh, a paramedic uh, shouting my name. Um, and he had, he had said that he was saying to me that I'd had an epileptic seizure. Um, so I went through all these various scanners in this hospital and eventually a doctor came to my bed and said that they had found a mass uh, on this one of these scans that they had done. And so you're thinking you had epilepsy, and the doctor comes to you and says, you now have a tumor on your brain. Yeah, yeah. So I was surprised how calm I was at this, because it was probably because of all the drugs that they pumped into me to get me out of this seizure. But I just calmly asked him, um, is it in a difficult area to get this thing out? Um, I was basically asking him if it was inoperable. Um, And he told me that it seems to be very operable. Um, It seems to be quite superficial and quite a low grade. So that sounds encouraging to you if you're... Yes, it does. Yeah, if you At at this stage, it seems quite... Yeah. So just to back up a bit, did you experience Mm -hmm. any other symptoms prior to having a seizure passing out at uh, your your, uh, girlfriend's parents? No, it was literally just the fatigue. It was, um, I mean, it is. It was no, like nothing I'd ever experienced before in terms of how fatigued I actually felt. But that's literally all I can remember as a symptom before it. So what happened after the doctor told you you have a tumor, uh, it appears to be low grade, and it's operable? Well, they sent that uh, scan data off to a specialist neuro center in Liverpool. And um, when I went there uh, a few days later, I saw a neurosurgeon who had looked at these in detail. And uh, he explained to me that it's a glioma. And he explained all the different types you can get in terms of grade. So one is what it's one to four, basically. Two and three 
are cancerous and um, one and two are benign. So he explained to me that I'm pretty much in the middle, that it's either a grade two or a grade three. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty devastating news. You must have been terribly shocked to hear that. Yeah, uh, that was the most frightened I've ever felt. What's going through your mind when they tell you that? Um, well, I was there with my fiance and my, well, her father. Um, and we were all just in tears in this room. And, but obviously the surgeons, they're very kind of poker faced and they probably see that a lot. What was the next move for you? Um, so the next move was I had to wait um, a while for them to plan how, how they're going to operate to remove as much of the tumour as possible. Um, and they told me that they won't know the actual grade of the tumour until they've taken it out and analysed it. So I would have to go through an operation and then wait another week for the results of what it actually is that they've taken out. So there must have been a, a little bit of optimism that this thing wouldn't be cancerous. They may not get yes. it all, but you somehow could survive. Do yeah, we were all sort of we were sort of in denial that this could ever be a grade three. We we just didn't want to think about that. Now tell me about the operation. Uh, I got to the hospital in the evening, and I would be the first to be operated on because I had. Uh, a very quite a long history of general social anxiety for throughout my 20s and at this point I'd just turned 30 so that morning I remember being wheeled through all these corridors and then I, I remember going into where you get put to sleep with all the anaesthetists um, and I could just about see the operating room just ahead of me uh, and I remember my heart race, uh, heart racing. Um, my adrenaline was really high. I was, yeah, I was pretty terrified at that point. I think one of the things I was most scared about was if if I didn't fall asleep. Um, I was kind of looking forward just to being knocked out. Well, they operated on your brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever think that you may not make it through the operation? Um, they said that there was like a 1% chance that I could die from the operation. Um, and I don't think I really thought I, I was going to face that. I, I thought I, w I, I would make it through. I don't know if it was the adrenaline that helped me blank that out, but it wasn't my main fear. Yeah. So you went through the operation. Tell us what happened after that. Um, so I remember coming round uh, in a ward and um, my throat was um, basically when you're put under, they put this big tube down your throat and unfortunately it had uh, ripped a bit of the uvula, which is kind of like that punch bag thing at the back of your throat. So I had a really bad gag reflex problem for quite a few days after the operation, which made eating quite difficult. I guess that was the least of your problems, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, because uh, the, th the thing I was most scared about was what the news would be uh, the following week when I get out. So you had to wait an entire week before they actually told you what transpired yeah. in the operation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have to kind of recover um, because the anesthetic really actually takes a lot out of you. And uh, they put you on steroids as well, as well, which can cause some other nasty side effects. I mean, the anxiety during that week must have been sky high for you. Yes, it was. Um, the anxiety was the worst it had ever been. It was pretty much the peak, the, yeah, the peak of it, I'd say. So a week later, the doctors come in. What do they tell you? Uh, I'm in this small room with my parents behind me and my fiancé to my right. And um, this neurosurgeon tells me, um, I'm afraid uh, it's turned out to be a grade three. 
you're going to need some radiotherapy. Uh, I'm afraid to tell you that this is a terminal diagnosis. So we were all just in shock and reduced to tears. And I remember when I left that hospital and got back to uh, my fiancé's parents' house, just feeling so lost and depressed and all the worst feelings you could imagine combined into one. How long did they say you had? Um, now, I was I was not brave about... I've never been brave about death. Like, some people are like, oh, I'm not afraid of dying and so on. I'm completely the, the opposite of that. I'm the sort of person that needs to have... Need, needs to, like, go through a vlog of what Aubrey de Grey has to say. I, I, I like the idea of living a long time and living a healthy life. And so going through all that experience, I was determined not to ask what my prognosis was. Almost like Um, you didn't want to know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, And I also thought that if I did ask about statistics, then I'd just end up becoming one. Like it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy sort of thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I know they've certainly done studies where, you know, I, I don't think they do it as much as they used to, where the doctor will say, you've got three months and they'll, they'll have yeah. patients die to the day because they yeah. honestly believe the what they're hearing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the placebo and the nocebo effect. So did they tell you, you had just a couple of years left? I mean, you're only 30 at the time. You were only 30 years old. Yeah. I'd only just turned 30. And, um, I, I remember I did ask him, can I make it to like 10 years? Can I make it 10 years? And he said to me, you can, but the amount of people that make it 10 years are very few. So I kind of just ran with that. (laughs) Yeah. So, Phil, you had the operation. You're given this terrible diagnosis that you just have a few years to live. um, And you need uh, radiotherapy. Yeah. Did you undertake uh, radiation? Yeah, I went through six and a half weeks, um, but luckily I had quite a bit of time before that started uh, because I still had to recover from all the inflammation caused by the surgery. But within that week, I was extremely proactive in terms of researching how I could improve my prognosis and hopefully get myself out of this horrible situation. What did you do? First of all, I looked at diet because I had tried to find people that had been diagnosed with grade threes that had survived uh, for quite some time. And the first survivor I came across was a guy who is actually my age. He lives in London. When he was diagnosed, he actually had a brain hemorrhage, so he actually had quite a serious injury from the result of this tumour. He was lucky, though, that he was studying um, diet at university at the time, and he found out about this ketogenic diet and how it can be used to almost starve cancer cells. So immediately I just cut out all processed sugar um, and bear in mind that this is not long after Christmas, so there's a, there's still a lot of candy around, and uh, I had to just really be disciplined at that stage. And um, I think a week before radiotherapy started, I actually went into ketosis. So tell listeners who may be unfamiliar with the ketogenic diet exactly what it is. Sure. Uh, so the ketogenic diet is a high fat uh low carbohydrate and moderate protein diet most diets are glucogenic diets where your carbohydrates are what give your brain power and keep you feeling awake and so on but when you're in ketosis your brain is running off fat uh in most cases this is a molecule called beta hydroxybutate which is produced in the liver when you're consuming a lot of fat and you don't have a lot of carbs. So a uh, week before you went in for radiation, you went into ketosis. How did you know yes. you went into ketosis? Uh, 
Um, I was using, uh, there's several ways to test. And at that stage, I was using uh, urine test strips. Mm -hmm. um, and halfway through um, therapy, I was using uh, like a, a blood tester thing, a bit like what a diabetic person would use or, where you prick your finger. Right. And how did you feel being in ketosis? Um, well, I actually felt pretty good because I was scared that um, I was going to be put on things like steroids because I was being warned by my medical team that were helping me through this process that um, most people like halfway through start to get very fatigued because your brain's being irradiated. Um, so people end up on steroids and so on. And I, I knew that other uh, long-term survivors online had actually had diabetic diabetes induced by being on steroids. So I really didn't want to go on those. But being in ketosis, because it's such an anti-inflammatory diet, I just never had those problems. Phil, when did you start taking cannabis? Okay, so CBD actually started in the first week because I'd that's just another part of the research that I was doing before therapy started. And I had seen a few papers that I think were actually done in Canada that show that if you're using uh, CBD and you're going through radiotherapy, that it can expose CB1s to uh, the x-rays. So I thought if I could use CBD uh, and take this oil sublingually before I go into the room where you get zapped <laughs> mm -hmm. that um hopefully it'll, it'll sort of hold the hand of this traditional therapy and make it work a bit better how did you find the cbd was is it plentiful in the uk um the cbd at that stage was actually really easy to access um you could just go on amazon and there was quite a few vendors giving that um they were probably around about twenty pounds for a small trencher. Phil, can yeah, my only sorry to interrupt here. Um, can we just confirm to listeners this was CBD derived from hemp, correct? Yes. Yeah, this not was CBD, CBD from, from cannabis. This is CBD from hemp. Mm -hmm. From hemp, yeah. But I was aware that whole plant cannabis with your THC and so on was also part of something I needed to get. So halfway through, so this would be three weeks in, luckily a friend of mine was able to provide me uh, with my first ever vape pen. Um, so it was, I was not using oil for the whole plant. I was actually using dried herb mm -hmm. in a herbal vaporizer. And it's I'm just so thankful to him that he gave me this halfway through because I was using this then throughout the rest of this treatment to make it work even better. How did you feel going through radiation therapy? When I got to that halfway marker, I was, I, I'd lost my hair all over, which was uh, quite surreal to, you know, get used to visually. Um, I'm losing, I felt, my, I'm losing my hair too, so no, <laughs> don't worry <laughs> about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Um, I, I, I've never been such. I've never been like vain about it, but I was kind of when losing your hair in in the sense of cancer. I kind of don't want to lose it just to be in defiance of cancer I because hear. it's something that cancer's causing, right? Yeah. But once I started using the whole plant cannabis, the absolute brilliant thing, and which was a revelation for me, was for the first time in say. 15 years, my anxiety went away the very next day. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, now you can imagine, right, I'm going through this really horrible situation and I've been going through it for like two months now at this point. And um, so my anxiety has just gone out the window and it's like a revelation for me and I can go through the rest of the treatment and just concentrate on trying to get better. That is fantastic. So you went yeah. through uh, radiotherapy, radiation therapy, for how, how long? Two and a half months? 
Um, yeah, so it was six and a half weeks in total. Six, six and a half weeks in total, a month and a just yeah. almost two months. Yeah. Now, now, did it eradicate the combination of the CBD, the THC, in the form of vaping and the radiation? When did you have a scan last? Uh, the, your very first scan, pardon me, after your radiation. Okay. Um, so after radiation, you your brain is very inflamed. So it has you have to wait, say, another six weeks before you actually go for an MRI. Um, so there is kind of a period after radiation stops where you're in limbo and you don't know what's coming ahead. You just hope for the best that it's worked. But when I got to that MRI... Um, I had a really good feeling because I felt so good. Um, it, a combination of the diet. The, I mean, the diet seemed to be working synergistically with the can cannabinoids. Um, I mean, I was still taking the CBD oil. And w when I was vaping the whole plant, I would always do that just before I went to sleep. And I'd always sleep quite early because I had learnt that if you – are taking something like indica which has a different kind of high to sativa so indica is great for making you feel sleepy right so i found out that that can increase melatonin if you take it at the right time so i was getting great night sleeps and feeling very active the next day very refreshed um, and the great thing about having increased melatonin is melatonin is the most anti-carcinogenic hormone that the body produces. And so you, when you had your first scan, tell us about that. Uh, the first scan, I, I was pretty nervous once I got into the actual scanner, but um, I was listening to Depeche Mode, so I was pretty calm. <laughs> <laughs> What was the result of the scan? Uh, well, the BBC were actually following me to that because I was actually on a documentary called um, Dying, for um, Dying for Cannabis. Uh, so they were doing a documentary about people that were having to use cannabis for medicinal purposes and uh, the risks they face in terms of the law and so on. So the BBC were having to wait outside the hospital because they didn't have permission to go inside. I went in there with my fiancé and my uh, mother and my father, and uh, my oncologist came out, and uh, he had this folder with him. And that's when my heart started to race when I saw that folder because, you know, that's that's the document that counts, right? Mm -hmm. Um and he just sat down and looked at me quite calmly and said, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that you have responded extremely well um, because there's nothing on the scan. Everything's gone. Uh, it's like a so there's no more cancer cells. Basically, this is a, the best your scan can get. Basically, it's uh, instantly into remission. Was that what he was expecting? Um, well, no, because he, he explained that this was an unexpected result because they told me that just before radiotherapy stopped that it's unlikely that the rest of the tumour will have reduced in size. It, what radiotherapy does is basically stop it from growing, like delays its growth. Yeah, so they weren't yeah. expecting it to disappear. <laughs> So it completely disappeared. There was no sign yeah. of the tumor at all. No signs of disease. That is fantastic. Have you had, yeah, I, and this was in June of last year, have you had a scan yeah. since then? Yeah, I've had like four scans since then that have all been clear. And they've all been clear. Awesome. You know, I, <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that you did the ketogenic diet. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Bob Malamede? Uh, no, I've not heard of him. Oh, he's great. Knows so much about cannabis and different disease conditions. He's definitely my go-to guy. At any rate, um, Bob swears by the uh, ketogenic diet in, in conjunction with cannabis oil for being very successful against cancer. 
Mm. Well, this is a, it's important to remember that this is a multi heterotous disease. You know, um, you can't attack it with just one thing. You have to attack it like with so many different things. You've got to bombard it. So it's, it's a combination that usually works. Yes. Phil, do you still vape at night? Yes, uh, I do that for maintenance. And also, um, I find that if I don't, then my seizure uh, activity goes up. And you're vaping dry material or you're vaping oil or you're vaping both? Uh, I vape dry, really, because uh, the way I see it is as long as I've got indica that's going to help me sleep better, then I can get that. I can ride that melatonin wave and that's another combination. So to me, it's not all about oil and taking it sublingually. It's about the THC. Because uh, I, I understand that if you do ingest it, then you're going to get that 11-hydroxy uh, come from the liver, which is very helpful against cancer. But that's another protocol, whereas my protocol is going for the melatonin. Yeah, you've got to do what works for you. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and uh, vaping works for you. Do you still take the CBD oil as well? Uh, actually, I've stopped taking the CBD oil, oil because... Uh, the ones that they actually sell in the UK contain a lot of vegetable oil, um, which is very high in omega-6, and that's mm -hmm. kind of counter what I'm trying to do, because omega-6 can be quite inflammatory if you have too much of it. Corey was saying in an interview that we did, uh, I think it was with Lynn Cameron the, or another person it, that uh, in the uk there are a lot of scammers tons of scammers in the uk oh yes yeah yeah way more than uh, i i think that's the worst place actually for scammers is the uk in my experience it's because it's uh total, mm. totally illegal in the uk both medicinally and recreationally isn't it yeah i mean but that's a that's a political thing because our government is very much in the hands of pharmaceuticals um they basically do as they're told in terms of a ph well pharmaceuticals when and the, how they lobby the government. Yeah, it's very so, much yeah. very much the same all around the world, Phil. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's interesting. It's abhorrent, though. Yeah, it's uh, Phil. It, how did you? Sorry, I just want to say, how did your fiance react to all of this uh, health issue that you went through? Well, she has stuck by me through. Thick and thin, she has really been my rock, really. Um, I don't know what I would have done without her. Uh, I mean, I, I honestly just can't wait to get married to her next month. You're getting married next month. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. She's got to love you if she stuck through this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good to hear. So you're healthy. You're taking, uh, you're vaping at night, uh, you're getting your THC, your tumor is gone, yeah. and you have to keep taking the THC or else you will have uh, brief seizures. But yeah. um, the doctors are probably a bit shocked, but uh, you're going to live a long and healthy life. Excellent. Yeah, that's what I hope. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. Phil, it was wonderful to talk to you. Great to hear your story, and it's uh, very encouraging for others around the world who may be in similar circumstances to know that uh, there are options out there, and uh, all they have to do is do what you did, just do a bit of research and change their diet and take cannabis. Definitely, yeah. And yeah. The important thing is to never give up, and yes you have to be very careful of scammers but there are ways around that because n now with the advent of facebook um there are basically regional cannabis clubs for every town in the uk people should join these clubs their nearest one and if they explain their predicament to these groups then they're more likely to be picked up by people who are growing and helping people out of the good of their own heart. Oh, that's very good. That's great to hear. Phil, thanks very much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on, and keep doing all that you do. Thanks so much, Phil. All right, guys. Take care now. And that's it, another edition of Cannabis Health Radio. If you'd like to tell your story about the use of cannabis for your health issue, 
send us an email at info at CannabisHealthRadio.com. And wherever you are in the world, thanks very much for listening. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. 